तो इसमें जल गिरावट भी करते हैं आ जाते हैं
Welcome and a very good evening to all of you. My name is Pratoy Nath. I teach history at Ashoka University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the session of Beyond the Classroom. Ashoka University, as you know, is a liberal arts university funded entirely by private and collective philanthropy. We aspire to make a difference in the field of higher education in India. Beyond the Classroom is an entirely online lecture series. It helps us take the Ashoka mode of pedagogy literally beyond the classroom and share it with the outside world. In a way, this is our method of making our teaching and research accessible to a broader audience. We think that this is particularly relevant in the present times as the world is engulfed in a devastating pandemic and each one of us are isolated in our own ways, not only physically, but often also psychologically and emotionally. Alongside Beyond the Classroom, there are also several other online ventures that the university is in the process of developing. At Ashoka X, a newly developed wing of the university, we are currently devoted to the process of creating and offering full online courses in at least two formats for a wider audience. For further details about this, please visit our Ashoka X website. Today, we have with us Dr. Johannes Burgers. Dr. Burgers is Assistant Professor of English and Digital Humanities at Ashoka University. He earned his PhD from City University of New York. He completed his Master's in Literary Studies from Utrecht University and Bachelor's in Liberal Studies from University College Utrecht. He also works as an Associate Director for the digital Jokna Pataufa project a multi-year collaborative project funded by the National Endowment for Humanities. His research interests include qualitative data visualization, narrative GIS, global modernism, transnational modernism, racial theories, sexology, aesthetics, William Faulkner and Jewish studies. Today, his lecture is titled, Always Present and Totally Forgettable mapping minor characters through literary demography. Before we begin, there are a couple of things I need to mention. First, Dr. Burgers will speak for about half an hour. After that, there will be an open discussion. We invite you to engage Dr. Burgers in questions during the using the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform in front of you. You can choose to share your name or also send in your question anonymously. Also, we record all the seminars of Beyond the Classroom. You can find them on our website in case you have missed some of them or missed this one, uh, or wish to revisit some of these lectures at a later date. We will share the link for the entire series with you soon. And now, Dr. Burgers, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Pratya, for that um, for that generous introduction, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I see some of my students. I can't see you obviously because it's a webinar, but I see some of my former students are in the participant list, um, and as they know, I like to make a lot of stupid jokes during my presentation, so I can only assume that you'll be laughing nonstop. Um, so um, thank you for spending your Saturday evening with me, and and if you're in the U.S., your Saturday morning. Um, today's talk might be a little bit different than a traditional lecture. I'm not going to propound some great truth. In fact, I'm just going to show you some work in progress. But in doing so, I want to reveal to you uh, not only the types of questions digital humanists might, like myself ask, but how we answer them. And then in the process, get, um, get you acquainted with some of the critical thinking that happens at the college level uh, when you're doing digital humanities research. And all great research is, is driven by a basic question. I and mean, my basic question is, you, know, you read books, you see movies, and we always pay attention to the protagonist, but what about those people in the background? What about minor characters? What is their role in creating fiction for us? To what extent do they create a social world for us or a social world for the, the main characters to interact with? Are they, 
are they merely part of the setting or the background, or do they play a larger role in, in shaping how we interpret a work? So that's my basic question. And I will say it's a tough one to answer. Um, because as far as literature goes, minor characters actually have a very tough go of it. Uh, famous characters like Hamlet and his ilk get all the attention. So even though Hamlet was staged 400 years ago, um, he keeps being revived by different actors. So Kenneth Branagh, um, Mel Gibson, Benedict Cumberbatch, Sarah Bernhardt at the turn of the century even did a, a version of Hamlet. And then beyond just actors reenacting Hamlet, you also have reimaginings of Hamlet. So we have Hamlet as a um, film student in Manhattan. We have uh, Hamlet as Donald Duck, not to be missed. We have Hamlet as a, this is a graphic novel from a Swedish duo called Barbro Lindgren and Anna Hogland. And of course, closer to home to India, we, we all know that um, Michel Bardwaj has made Hyder, which is a version of Hamlet set in Kashmir. It's a fantastic movie. And then beyond Hamlet, uh, we have, um, it's not just that Hamlet gets all this attention, even secondaries in that, uh, secondary characters in that play um, get their own version, their own um, fictions. So Tom Stoppard wrote the purgatorial Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Um, Kaida Svich wrote 12 Ophelias. And in fact, Hamlet and Hamlet's afterlives are so prominent that my colleague, um, Dr. Jonathan Gil Harris is teaching a graduate course on specters of Hamlet. If you're an English major, this is well worth checking out. But the minor characters in Hamlet don't get any attention. Um, no one cares about Bernardo and Francisco. And if you've read the play, these are the two guards who open up the play when you first read Hamlet, these are the these are the first characters to appear. And I have to confess, when I was putting together this presentation, I actually didn't realize they had names. I thought they were just called uh, guard one and two. Um, and then when I looked at those, I was like, oh wait, they do have names. They actually have entities outside of just being guards. Um, now it's doubly embarrassing that I didn't know that because I actually used to teach Hamlet, so I should have known it. But maybe that says more about me than it does about minor characters. In any case, there isn't any research or any spin-offs of um, uh, Bernardo and Francisco, precisely because there's not a whole lot there. There's some dialogue, but you you wouldn't you couldn't have a full-fledged paper about them. And, and so it generally goes with minor characters because there's they play such a individually they play such a small role. They don't really uh, have any bearing on the on the um, overall interpretation of the work. Sometimes, though, this hierarchy gets disrupted. So for example, with the show Friends, uh, one of the critiques of that show um, is that the cast is not diverse. Um, and that's complemented by critiques that not only is the cast not diverse, but it's set in New York. And for the first several seasons of the show, the people in the background were not representative of New York at all. It was um, a bunch of other white people. And if you've ever been to New York or seen uh, other shows on you, you know that's an incredibly diverse place. So this led to a lot of critique. And most of it is online, and I tried to research actual scholarship into this, but there's a very telling reason why this hasn't really been um, investigated from a scholarly perspective. Um, another way to think about it is that sometimes um, Hollywood does represent diversity, but it represent it, represents it in a, in a problematic way. So the film 300 from 2006, uh, is, the, is the retelling of the Spartan war against the, or the Greek war against the, the Persians. And here too, um, there's a problem with the people in the background, uh, or one of the controversies was that every time a Persian comes into view, it is a grotesque and monstrous figure. And so, again, there's these series of articles that, uh, that go on to, to make this point. And it's all blogs or editorials on, on entertainment sites. The problem is that none of this is very scholarly, right? If you were to prove this as a scholar, how would you go about it? Um, I mean, there are scholars who've tackled the friends issue, but they mentioned it in passing, right? That it's a very white cast and the cast admits it. Um, but beyond this, how do, you, how do you go about proving that one show is holding up a type of um, 
racial hierarchy. Uh, in fact, we could look at shows from the 90s and think, well, you know, it's not as if Seinfeld was very diverse. It's not as if uh, Home Improvement or Step by Step or Family Ties, all these other shows that were broadcast around the same time had very diverse casts either. They were all largely white. So to what extent is Friends any whiter than those shows? Um, and one of the things that you would have to do is you would have to watch those shows and count the people in the background. The same could be said with 300. Um, to what extent is this any different than other movies that represent large scale battles between different peoples? Um, and how are those different peoples represented? Right? And oftentimes the enemy is, is seen as embodying types of characteristics that are not white in those movies. So to understand uh, truly what whiteness means or what othering means, you would have to create some sort of baseline to, to be able to compare uh, both the, um, the shows to itself, but the shows to one another. And obviously there's a physical limit to how many movies and shows you can watch for research. In fact, um, I'm sure all of you are reaching your physical limits of how many movies and shows you can watch during quarantine, right? So if you were to look at say, if you wanted to compare Seinfeld and Friends, that would take a long time because those are very long runs of those, of those shows and each episode is, is around 30 minutes. And so you'd have to watch all of it and count it. Uh, this is a very hard question for uh, traditional humanists to ask, uh, to answer. So this is where digital humanities comes in. So digital humanities leverages the power of computational systems to supplement, complement, or replace conventional humanities research methods. Basically, it asks questions that would not be answerable through close reading, archival work, or other traditional humanities methods. They're not mutually exclusive. Sometimes you're doing close reading, sometimes you're doing archival work. Um, but the scale at which this operates exceeds that which a single person would be able to do. Now, um, just a fair caveat, there's many types of uh, digital humanities research. Some of them are connected. Um, some of them are less connected. So corpus linguistics, for example, looks at 20 to 30,000 texts at the same time, while 3D modeling tries to create um, historical models of temples, churches, uh, that type of stuff. And those are radically different enterprises. So it's not as if every digital humanist is doing the same thing. In fact, I work in a field called literary cartography and GIS, and I'll, I'll fully confess that I, that I don't know a whole lot about some of the other stuff that folks are doing, because this is pretty, this can get pretty niche pretty quickly. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on um, that, uh, that doesn't even have names yet. But moving on to our main question, so how would you prove uh, race, gender, um, and uh, say age differences in Hollywood? A team out of the University of um, Southern California has actually done this, Anil Ramakrishna, and this team um, basically let a computer watch, quote unquote, a thousand movies, right? If you were to watch a thousand movies by yourself, if you assume they're all two hours long, that's two hours of, 2,000 hours of movie watching. That's very, very time intensive. So they took um, a database of scripts, of, uh, of about a thousand scripts, and then they matched um, the characters with the actors on IMDb, so this internet movie database. And so they could get the demographic data from the movie database and then the dialogues that those characters spoke um, from the scripts. And uh, what they concluded, I mean, it's sort of, a, it's not entirely shocking what they concluded, but uh, what they saw is that the majority of people who are on screen in Hollywood, or at least in the South as movie, thousand movies are white men. Um, white women are roughly half of that. Uh, you see that peak here is at 300, the peak for white men is at, at 600. And then it declines very precipitously um, if it's not a white person. So um, you'll note that for African-Americans, the peak is at 30 um, to 80 over there. So um, you just have far more representation by, by white people. Now, how were they able to do this? Um, 
movie scripts have a special feature to them that narrative text doesn't. Movie scripts are semi-structured data um, because it's already divided into acts, scenes, and then you have each character name with the dialogue attached to it. So it's, it, it's not uncomplicated, but it's not terribly challenging for a computer to figure out this is when this person is speaking and this is for how long they're speaking. And if you're able to match that to a, a database, um, you can get that demographic data from the text. And in fact, I, I point out this project, but there's been a lot of work done about representations of gender and race um, in Hollywood or TV shows uh, through these types of computational techniques, because you can look at whole runs of shows um, relatively, relatively quickly. The computer can do this for you. Characters in fictions are a different animal. There's many different types of characters. And so setting up an algorithm to not only fish out the characters, but to differentiate them is very problematic because you're dealing with what are essentially a lot of edge cases. So in the show Family Guy, Brian is a dog. Uh, the character Brian is a dog. You could do that with the script fairly easily, but figuring that out computationally that there's going to be this one text that has a dog in it that also talks, that is, um, that is a main character. Um, you're, you're building up a lot of edge cases into the algorithm and that makes it very difficult to figure this out. Um, and the, the takeaway though is still that in literature, one of the reasons we read it is that we get to walk in someone else's shoes for a little bit. Um, and this is part of the reason why we read literature. So it is an important issue to, to consider how different characters are represented in these texts. In this, minor characters are rarely studied. Um, one of the few books on this is called The One Versus the Many by Alex Wallach. And he asked these very pertinent questions to this. How are a character's appearances positioned in relation to other characters and to the thematic and structural totality of the narrative? Why does a particular character suddenly disappear from the narrative or abruptly begin to gain more narrative attention? These are all dynamics that we pick up on in the text, but it's hard once we finish the text to, to quantify them somehow. So characters in fiction are really, really hard to find uh, computationally, as I was saying earlier, um, because there's so many different types of characters and there's so many types of edge cases. Um, novels and short stories are unstructured data. You obviously have chapters and pages and numbers uh, and page numbers and punctuation. Um, but extracting entities from that, extracting characters from that is actually a pretty complicated task. So inferring gender, for example, is very difficult and inferring race is very, very difficult because there's no external database to refer to. You can't cross match the text, the unstructured text with some sort of external database like these other guys are doing. Now, obviously when you're online, um, tech companies know all sorts of stuff about you, but in part that's because you're, you're filling in all sorts of surveys so they're collecting that demographic data about you. And who knows, they may be able to do stuff with unstructured text that I'm unaware of, but those would be proprietary secrets that um, are the, the purview of uh, billion dollar tech companies and not uh, a lowly English professor like myself. So this is why large scale or medium to large scale character analysis usually relies on linguistic and statistical inference. It's not that every time they find a character, it's going to be, um, they're going to match it. It's going to be a, um, an exact match to what that character is. It's just the overall pattern. They're trying to, to pull the signal from the noise, so to speak. So this is what Andrew Piper did in a book called Enumerations. It's a little bit easier to look at an example than to talk about it in the abstract. He looked at a corpus of 20,000 um, British novels from the 19th century, and he was able to extract 1.7 million characters from that. Uh, so that's, that's quite a number of characters to look at. Um, and then once you have the characters, you can identify them by gender because some names are gendered, like Rachel is generally a women's name. And then through a process called pronoun resolution, you match that name with uh, the, uh, the indefinite pronoun. So Rachel walked down the street, she was happy. We then know that she is referring to Rachel. So we can count 
the amount of times that Rachel appears in the text. And there's a very sophisticated way in which computers can figure out which characters are appearing and, and how often and what gender they are. This, of course, breaks apart when you are confronted with either uh, genderly uh, names that have an ambiguous gender in English. So St Stacy can be a male and a female name. Carrie can be a male and a female name. Uh, Taylor can be a male and a female name. Um, or names that just are not familiar to the English corpus. And then you also run into trouble with non-gendered nouns, right? So the baker, the cook, the pedestrian, those are all minor characters. You might go to a bakery and the baker hands you the bread. Um, but there's no, no way of knowing if that baker would be male or female in the text unless you get some more, more context. And the, computationally, it's hard to, to figure out uh, from the context what the gender would be. Uh, nevertheless, you can still do very sophisticated uh, analysis based on this. So what Piper shows is essentially that the women, texts that were written by women, the women in those texts tend to, to be more into interior. They tend to think more. They think to tend to be more cogitative um, than the men. Um, in terms of trying to figure out, say, the race or the class of the character, this is almost impossible to infer um, based on just the text. For example, in Faulkner, there's a lot of references to juries or a number of references to juries. Um, the computer can't figure out that those juries would be all white men because legally that would just be the case. There were no women on juries and there were no African-Americans on juries. So it would have been an exclusively white male enterprise. Uh, but when you're reading the text, this, is not, this isn't a challenge to you. If you know a little bit about the American South, uh, you would be able to figure this out. So the real problem with these linguistic methods um, is that you're not dealing with structured data. So you can't really quantify the different types of characters. And this is where my work comes in with uh, William Faulkner and the Digital Yakta Vitafa project, um, of which I'm just a small cog in a very, very large, large project. So, um, and this project wasn't just designed to do the type of work I'm showing off now. So who was William Faulkner? Very briefly, he was a Mississippi-born writer who rose to prominence in the middle of the 20th century. He wins the Nobel Prize in 1949. And he's probably one of the most taught and most written about authors, uh, 20th century American authors. There's about 40,000 publications on him. So he's a very well-established author. Um, most of his work is about a place called Yaknapatafa County. Um, and in that county is a town called Jefferson. And these are all based on his native northern Mississippi. And there's a little town called Oxford there. Um, and that is set in Lafayette County. Now, what is his work about and why did it become so famous? Using what he called his postage stamp of native soil, he traces the decline of the aristocratic planter class and the ascendancy of the redneck as the South shifts from a largely agrarian to an industrial society. In doing so, he also renders a highly sensitive portrait of those caught in between these two social forces, African-Americans, women, Northerners, and other interlopers. Highly experimental, his fiction shuttles effortlessly to personal, local, regional, and universal. So you have a major American author dealing with a host of issues that are still very pertinent today, class, race, gender. Uh, notably, they're all filtered through William Faulkner's perspective, and it should be said that growing up in the South uh, during Jim Crow or during racial segregation, um, it's almost inevitable that Faulkner inherited some of the prejudices of his day. Uh, but he's a very sensitive reader of the social dynamics that are going on in the South. So it's a worthwhile enterprise to study him at length. In fact, you could spend your entire life doing it and you would be very happy. So, um, Digital, the Digital Yaknapatafa project is a brainchild of uh, Stephen Railton out of the University of Virginia. And uh, it's hosted at the University of Virginia and a lot of the technical work is being done there. So the long and the short of the project is what we did is about 30 scholars worked for many years to code every location, character and event that happens in Faulkner's fiction into a database and that constitutes 14 novels and 54 short stories, or about 8,000 pages worth of text. And you'll note that this is much, much smaller than what someone like Andrew Piper is working with, where he's working in 
20, 30,000 texts, and we're only looking at um, 14. But it takes years and years to do all this coding because you have to read each text and then put in each character. And when I say each character, I mean every random baker, pedestrian person who comes in, um, we look at. So uh, one of the things that helped us um, find the locations of, of where to put this, right? Because you can find characters and you can find events, you can break up the narrative into events, but it's very hard to map fiction onto something. Um, there's many pieces of fiction that you simply wouldn't be able to map because they don't they don't go anywhere. It's not, you know, even in Hamlet, there's not a, a um, there, there's not a real place that you could necessarily go to to map this out. Luckily for us, Faulkner created two maps, one in 1936 and one in 1935, which plots out where some of his major fictions take place. And based on these maps, we were uh, create, able to create a digital model that consolidated these locations um, on which we then projected the, um, the different locations in the narrative. And so this is our main interface. Um, I'm not going to show it online because the number one rule of digital humanities is that if you need the internet, it will not work. Um, but this is our uh, interface for the sound and the fury, and you can do this for every individual text. And on that, you can then plot uh, the locations and the natural features. So these little houses right here. You can also plot the characters, and the characters are broken up by race and by stature and by gender and by um, whether they're a group or an individual. And then you can also add on to that events. So if you play down here, it will go through the narrative and show you where particular events are taking place. Um, this is the main interface, but because you have all this data, we can keep building on and building on and doing different things. Um, and in fact, if I were to uh, demonstrate the entire site, it would take a very, very long time indeed. Um, but suffice to say that this is very laborious to put together because each individual dot there represents about 50 data points because you have to enter, you know, 12 data points on a character, another 12 on uh, on events, and then some some odd number more for locations. So in total, what you're looking at, I know this seems like a, a maybe from from your perspective, somewhat simplistic um, rendering, but this is there's a lot of data behind this. But once you have that data, there's a whole lot you can do with it. So for example, you can pull up the biography on each character in the text. And again, biography, biography is for every character, all 5,000 of them. Uh, every location has a description. Every event has a description. And then we also have master descriptions of um, the characters and the locations. So how they work through the fiction. Uh, you can pull in archival material. So this is uh, a page that uh, the original writing of The Sound and the Fury. And you can listen to audio recordings of Faulkner talking about the text. So it's this very integrated hub for uh, students and scholars to explore. And then you can do some more advanced visualizations like this, or make a heat map like this. Uh, and the stuff that I do is I take all the maps, about 68 of them, and I, I basically take them and I smash them and I put them all together, and then I map them out. So I look at the corpus not as a series of individual stories, but rather as one entire saga. Um, now, this is a fairly meaningless map. It just tells you where the different population centers are in Yakhtapatafa. But since we have demographic data, we can break that up by demography. And since we have the event data, um, we can add a narrative to it and play it at the time. So for the next animation, I'm just going to show you very briefly um, how Yakhtapatafa County gets built over the course of 200 years. At the bottom right, you'll see the little year counter here. And I've broken it up not by the, the racial designations that we have in the database, because there's eight of them, and it becomes very garish to show that many colors. So I have created four major groups, African-American, Anglo-American, mixed ancestry. So anyone um, from, from, say, a biracial marriage or my biracial union, and then Native Americans who are the third major group in the, in the corpus. So I'm just gonna play this. And what you're gonna see is you're first gonna see the plantations getting settled uh, alongside the, the Native American locations. And then slowly but surely, you're gonna see the town in the middle of Jefferson here start to emerge. And then finally, you see this small town called the Hamlet emerge, which is a white working class area of the county. 
So here we see the people in the US, the first events in the US are over here. And we start to see uh, activity here in the Native American areas. And we should start to see uh, this McCaslin plantation start to come up pretty quickly. There it goes. And then there's the Sardis plantation over here and the Septon plantation over here. By the turn of the century, the town starts to grow and this secondary place starts to grow. And so what we see is there's an overwhelming number of uh, white folks. Um, the Native Americans are kind of constrained to this area. And the African Americans are, are largely found on plantations, which isn't all that surprising if you, uh, if you think of the sociology of the South. None of this tells us anything about background characters though. And I'm gonna go very briefly to, to how you would go about answering that question of how do we think of a major character interacting with a minor character? Because we have that data. We have minor and peripheral characters in the database. So the demographic data shows us what types of characters exist. And then event data shows us when characters are together at a specific location and the frequency with which certain types of characters appear in the text. So we can use those two variables to kind of fine tune this and to slice into the data. If we just look at the, uh, the raw distribution, so how often different types of characters appear, we'll note that Anglo-American or white men over, make up the overwhelming majority of the people who appear in this text. So if you're reading Faulkner, a lot of times what you're looking at is the experience and, and lives of white men. In fact, 63% of the time, there's a major, uh, there's a white man in the, in the frame. 37% of the time, it's someone else. Um, so you'll note that the, it's a very uh, uniform perspective. Um, now, the mixed ancestry in Native American are somewhat smaller groups. So I've left them out of the subsequent analysis. And of course, we could uh, pull them up later if we wanted to. So I'm going to focus exclusively on African American and Anglo American. And what I would want to know in the segregated South is how often does it happen that a, a white character interacts with a black character? And is that character a, a minor character? And where does that interaction take place? Right, because then we can start to get a sense of how um, these minor characters are being used in this text. So we can put it all on a pie chart. I know this is a little bit overwhelming to look at, uh, but I've, essentially the darker colors indicate that a character is a major character and the lighter the shade, the more minor they become. And we notice that um, not only is it an overwhelmingly white male corpus, but white major characters constitute the majority of the people that we see. Um, and we would suspect that a lot of this is white major characters interacting with one another and interacting less frequently with say white female characters or um, white um, African-American male characters. Of course, um, this is all assuming um, that the, these statistics are evenly distributed because one could also argue um, that all of the white interactions are taking place in one novel and all of the African-American interactions are taking place in, in other texts. And there's so something to be said for that. But the way we would check that is we would um, do something called co-occurrence analysis. Uh, the math behind this is kind of fancy, so I'm not going to get into it too much. But it's basically um, calculating when different types of characters occur in different types of events. Uh, but since we also have the locations what we can do is we can figure out what types of spaces are they moving in? Uh, are, are they interacting in when they're interacting with each other? Um, now, I will say that we classified all of the different locations as a house, cemetery, church, different types of buildings. And we I broadly categorized those as domestic space and public space. So in the next graph, we see um, I've taken the white male perspective or the white um, major character perspective here, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've looked at co-occurrence by race, gender, and rank. I know it's kind of, statistically speaking, this is very, uh, very involved, but essentially what it's saying is when there's a white character, what percentage of the time do they interact with someone of the same race? So uh, either a white woman or a white man, 
what percentage of the time do they interact with someone of uh, a different race, but of the same gender? So um, a black man or a black woman? And what percentage of the time do they interact with um, someone who is both of a different race and a different gender? So you note that in domestic space, the majority or the, the plurality of the time, it's white people of the same gender interacting with each other. So either white women or white men. Sometimes it's white men and white women together, right? So, and that makes sense if you're married or if you have a sister or a brother, this is these types of same race interactions are going to happen. And then interactions between different races and genders happen um, 15% of the time. So not an insubstantial amount of times are white characters, major white characters interacting with a minor or peripheral African-American characters who are, um, who are obviously a different race, but sometimes they're also a different gender. And that's happening in domestic space. And if we know a little bit about the South, we can kind of figure out why that would be, right? Because a lot of times African-Americans were servants for the richer white families uh, during Jim Crow. And before Jim Crow, obviously through enslavement, uh, these interactions would be happening. The effect of segregation on public space though is very, very pronounced. You'll notice that in public space, space, white men or white women are the majority of the time, those are the types of interactions that you see. In sometimes you see white men and white, white women interacting with each other, almost never 4% of the time do you see it where there's a, a major white character interacting with um, character of a different race or a different gender. So those boundaries were, were very strictly policed, right? Imagine a white woman interacting with a black man in the Jim Crow South. I mean, this was uh, this was very taboo. Uh, what was probably more likely is a is a, a white man interacting with a, um, a black woman because that was deemed a safer, um, right? Um, so we can see the effect that um, segregation has on public space in the South. Um, and we can also spatially locate these. So this map is a, it's a, it's a lot to look at, but essentially if we look at our intuitions, say this is all about segregation and this is all about the legacy of slavery. Um, if we look at domestic space, this is where the majority of African-American white interactions are happening at this plantation, this plantation, uh, a little bit up here, and then at the Compton place. You'll note that in Frenchman's Spend, which is largely white, there's almost exclusively interactions between white men and white women um, in their houses. Then when we move to public space, it's more condensed to the city center. And this place is far whiter. It's white men interacting with white women the interactions between races happen around the plantation. And that's the interesting thing. It's that um, even though, yes, African-Americans do have a sense of public space, the public space is limited to the country and not to the town. They, they don't get to go to town as often as white characters do. Uh, they don't live there. They don't um, necessarily have anything to do there. Uh, that's not to say that there's no African-American characters in town. There's even a little area called Negro Holler up here. So there, there is that um, small population, but most of the events are taking place in and around plantations. Now, there's a lot of information to throw at you and what, what can we conclude from this? Well, the first conclusion is that there's a substantial difference between the number of white men and other types of characters in the cor corpus. Um, what types of characters interact with minor characters or the background characters is often mediated by the type of space. So whether it's a domestic space or public space, there is less interaction across race and gender in public space. Public and domestic spaces can be further refined by their proximity to town or to a current or former plantation. So it's more likely that there's gonna be an interracial interaction when it's a public space close to a plantation, but not so much in town. Um, while African-American men and women do appear in the background throughout the corpus, uh, they predominantly populate the areas in and around the plantations. Um, and we may ask, and I don't have uh, the full-fledged evidence to, um, 
to really think through, think this through more thoroughly. But to what extent this tracks with uh, historical reality? Uh, we have here on our right the, the demographic makeup of Yakutat or Lafayette County, uh, which is roughly, you know, at at its height, it's 60% white folks and 40% black folks. But those margins were far narrower than than certainly we saw in the data. Um, so in his imaginary, the fictional town of Jefferson is probably more white than the actual Oxford, Mississippi would have been. Um, it's, it's unclear what we would do with that information. You know, um, it's, um, it's, it, it would be, um, it would be incautious to, uh, to jump to the conclusion that somehow uh, Faulkner was erasing black people from, from his corpus. I think, um, we would have to look at the data far more carefully and complement it with close readings of the text. So that's that's where I leave you with that sort of unsatisfactory half answer. But uh, this is the type of, I hope I've been able to demonstrate the type of work uh, that a digital humanist does and how we draw together different data sources to come to different conclusions. Thank you very much. I saw some questions pop up in the chat while I was uh, presenting, so we'll address those. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Burgers. And uh, I mean, rarely do we get to see this interweaving of quantitative analysis with literature. And I think your, your lecture really opened our eyes in that direction. So thank you. Uh, yes, there have been several questions that have uh, been submitted while you were speaking. And uh, let's see how many of that we can accommodate in the roughly half an hour that we have left. Uh, so the first one is from Praveen Kumar, who asks, do you think it makes sense to give equal importance to all the minor characters? Won't it spread thin the central theme and leave us with nothing of significance? Uh, Johannes, I would like to ask you if you would like to take all the que some questions together, or if you would like to go over this one by one. Uh, if, there's a w if there's a way to weave them together, that might be uh, the most expeditious. Okay, so let me also then read out the next couple of questions. Uh, Yamini Krishnan has asked, I'm wondering how you could uh, computationally track the arcs of characters that are less obviously coded as a certain race, gender, sexuality, community, geographical location, etc. And what happens to the data if, as a result of the plot, things change in terms of the specifics of a character in the novel, or if a reader only finds out about these specifics of identity in the middle of the narrative? And let me just read out one more. Uh, Ruthvi Zamre asks, do softwares that quantify fiction run into problems of gender race bias when trying to quantify words such as driver or scientist or janitor? As in, do they associate driver with male or janitor with African-American or Hispanic? Since that is a problem that softwares and AI uh, in other fields often run into, I was wondering if that's the case with the softwares you mentioned here. So I think Johannes, if you take these three and then we can come back to the rest, if that's okay with you. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll work my way up in reverse order. I think um, both Yamini and, and Ruthvi, thank you for your questions. Um, those are two very important questions because they, they, they get right at the heart of uh, one of the core issues, which is how do you, um, what is the ontology of a character, right? Is, is a character um, just a series of linguistic signs that accrues identity over the course of the text? Or is a character something that is complete, but it is described incompletely, right? So is it necessary that every character has a race? Um, you, if you read the baker in a text, a person may imagine uh, that the baker is a she or the baker is a he, but oftentimes for the plot, it makes no difference. Um, um, and so the, one of the underlying assumptions is that when you're doing this type of work is that in fact, all characters have an ontology and therefore characters have a race or a, or a class or a gender, which you can then define. Um, one of the conveniences with uh, Faulkner is that it's a relatively conservative society. 
And so these, um, these categories are, are relatively stable and it was okay for us to categorize these, but you run into problems with a lot of fiction where you try to quantify or qualify if someone's race, class or gender or sexuality. Um, and so that, that point is well taken. It's not so much a function of the software, it's rather the uh, oftentimes the training algorithm that goes into that software, but it's ultimately up to the people designing that uh, to think, of, think that through. What uh, Andrew Piper does in enumerations doesn't get to the level of uh, a race, so there's no real bias in there. Um, the only gender biases you might have is with um, uh, particular names that, that um, that are either unknown or um, tend to be biased more to one than to another. And to um, Praveen's point, do you think it makes sense to give equal importance to all minor characters? Um, that's a great question. That's a great, and it's something that I'm wrestling with um, when I'm doing this quantitative research because we've split it up into major, secondary, minor, peripheral, but then we also have individuals and groups. So do we give the same level of prominence to say a minor character who speaks as to a bunch of people hanging out in the background. Um, that feels wrong to say that they're the same thing. Um, and yet, if you look at them in the aggregate, they, they do tell you something about the, the texture of that social world, um, because it does appear that um, more often than not, you know, the interaction between um, major and peripheral characters tend to be mediated along their lines of race. So it's a great question, Praveen, and there's no easy answer to this um, because you know, you're know you always gonna have to slice the data some way and um, those decisions end up, um, end up determining the outcome. I will say that one of the advantages of digital humanities is because you can constantly slice and re-slice the data, you don't have to say this is the one data point that's going to prove the point, but rather you would bring in a concert of data points. You would say these are five different uh, data points that are sometimes competing, um, and we build our interpretation around that. Thank you, Johannes. Now a quick, quick uh, round to some of the other questions. Shoma Sri Day has asked two questions. Uh, the first is, what about the portrayal of characters, gender or sophistication in the imaginary town of Malguri from R.K. Narayan? And her second question is, how about comparing the literary darkness and melancholy of Murakami, which sees the pain of one character through the other gender's lens? Not to deny strong bonds and relations that are seen beyond color, gender and origins. And a couple of questions have come from Shudeep Ghosh, who has asked, how will all this contribute to the decoding of literary studies, firstly? And secondly, what is the philosophy behind this critical enterprise? Over to you, Johannes. So, Shumashri, thank you for your question. So, I will say that I've, um, uh, I've never read Malgudi's or uh, Arcane Orion, so uh, that's, that's on me to, to not uh, know more about that. Um, but I think you're questions are basically the same ilk, which is um, how does what I've done work on author X, right? I get this question a lot. Like, okay, I like what you did with Faulkner, but I don't really care about Faulkner. How can you do this with someone else? Um, the problem is that this is, this is very labor intensive. So in order to figure out your question, uh, you would have to spend a lot of time entering data and then calculating it, which raises the question, is it worth it? Right? So if you're talking about, say, um, looking at a Murakami novel, the far more efficient way of, of reading a Murakami text is by just reading it. Um, you can often find a lot more in a text by if you just simply sit down and read it. And so uh, thinking about a particular style or a particular embodiment of one character in a text, um, you'd be better off just reading the text and using a quote unquote traditional method, right? Digital humanities is not trying to replace what um, what current history and, and uh, English majors are, or English professors are doing. They're simply trying to complement it and trying to ask different questions. And in fact, we rely a lot on those close readings of those texts to inform our data. Um, because oftentimes just looking at the data can lead you astray and you can come to all sorts of conclusions that don't really resonate with uh, what other folks are saying. And in fact, one of the nice things to find out is that um, is that a lot of the theories that people came up with about Faulkner in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s 
are bearing out in the data in the and um, you know which just goes to show you that close reading as a methodology is very very effective um, and then so do you, i'm i'm not sure what you mean by the decoding of literary studies i think it's just adding another branch to literary studies um, and helping to think through how we can look on at, at literary text on a more macro level rather than a close reading level. You'll note that a lot of literary studies enterprises, if you look at a, a standard academic monograph, it's one theory and then say they analyze four different books or five different books. We're doing that at a different scale. So we're looking at, I'm looking at 14 different books at the same time and other books are looking at 20 or 30,000 books to detect trends. And the philosophy behind this enterprise, I mean, that's a that's a larger debate, but I think one of the one of the attractive things for me with um, digital humanities is that there's no set methodology yet. So a lot of it is just screwing around with the data and figuring out what the data can do and figuring out new ways. What I do, literary demography, I don't think anyone really does it because it hasn't been possible. But now I get to screw around and define the terms of the debate. Uh, and no doubt other people will come and replace me and do a better job. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, a couple of other questions have come out in the meantime. Uh, Palak Aroda has said that she wants to do a PhD in this field and would welcome your suggestions. And there is one question from Arjun Ghosh who has asked, has there been an attempt to pick up the sentiment around particular characters to maybe figure out their status within the text? And finally, Yamini Krishnan has asked one more question. Can you use digital humanities software on poetry and other forms that don't have as clear a narrative running through them and get actual useful results from that data? Over to you, Johannes. Uh, so Palak, just a very quick uh, point. Uh, I mean, uh, I teach DH at, uh, at uh, Ashoka and we have a PhD program. So by all means, email me. Um, Arjun, um, so there's a book by Matthew Jockers called Macro Analysis that does exactly this. Uh, what he does is he analyzes the different sentiments around different characters at different points in the text. And he figures out basically what the emotional arc of a text is based on the character by aggregating the, the character data. Um, and this sentiment analysis can get very sophisticated in terms of fine tuning how particular characters are feeling. Yami, I would again refer to my my previous point where you have the, the question is always, well, is this going to be worth my time to do in a DH way? If you're reading poetry and you can get away with just reading the poetry, which in and of itself is a very complex activity, um, um, just read the poetry. I will say that one of the nice things about poetry is that it's semi-structured data. So you can do a lot with the layout on the page. The fact that poetry is separated spatially, you can do a lot of analysis in terms of figuring out, um, for example, stanza lengths or, or, um, or line lengths and uh, different punctuation. So um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with poetry that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do with prose. It's just, it really depends on the, on the question you're asking. So one of the, the things that I would wonder about is over what period of time does the spatial representation of poetry get more compact? When you think of someone like E.E. E. Cummings versus someone like um, Shakespeare or, or Petrarch um, uh, writing sonnets versus this minimalist, minimalist poet by I say someone like Gwendolyn Brooks, over what period of time does that happen in, in the history of poetry? So you could very well use computers to look at that, that long arc. Thank you for your question. Right, I don't think we have any other questions. If anybody has any, any comments or any suggestions or any questions, this is your last chance. <laughs> so please type in your questions in the chat box. We have another few minutes that we can devote to this discussion. <clears throat> In the meantime, I would like to quickly point out a couple of things about some of the uh, upcoming attractions of Ashoka's online offerings. Uh, next, see, oh, 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, on next Saturday, that's 5th of December, we actually have with us Dr. Imroz Khan from the Department of Biology for a similar seminar. And the title of this lecture is Bugs and Pandemics, Darwinian Dilemmas in Emerging Infectious Diseases. And there are also a host of four live online courses that are on offer this December and January on what we call Ashoka Academy. The registration process is still open and you can go ahead and register for these courses on our Ashoka X webpage. Uh, there is one more question coming back, yes. Yeah, uh, Dia, that's a such a great question. So the, the, the Bechdel test is, um, is um, in part, it's also about sexuality, right? Like if, if two women are in a frame and one, uh, and if they're not talking about men, uh, then maybe it's a same sex relationship. And, and Alison Bechdel kind of said this as a joke and it's become this standard way of thinking about the representation of women in um, both in comic books or graphic novels, but also in, um, in literature and in movies. And there's actually been researchers who've taken the Bechdel test and operationalized it into um, something that you could do with a computer. So if you want to email me, Dia, just email me and I'll send you the article that, that does this. Um, it's a fascinating piece of scholarship. Great, I think if there are no more questions, I think we can conclude the session. Well, thank you very much, Johannes, for this really amazing presentation and for you know, showing literature to us in this completely new life that so few of us get to think about or hear about. And uh, I would also sincerely like to thank all our uh, you know, guests, our members of the audience who logged in today to listen to Dr. Burgers. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we would also love to know your feedback, how you liked or disliked you know, some elements of today's session. So there's a, a feedback survey that will pop up on your screen presently. And if you could just take a couple of minutes to answer these questions, that would really mean a lot. And uh, all these seminars are also being recorded, including today's seminar with Dr. Burgers that will be available on our website. And you can go ahead and listen to that uh, at, at any later point of time. So thanks to all of you and thanks to Dr. Burgers for today's amazing seminar. Good night to all of you, bye. Thank you.